start with from a place of gratitude because I think it's important that we thank the people. Can you hear me? Yes. We were, they asked me, do you need a mic? I'm like, no. Sometimes people take the mic away from me. <laughs> so for now, I don't think I need it. Um, but I do want to say thank you so much for all of you who took time today. I know it's a busy time. I know you all have a lot going on in January. Everyone says there's this downtime in higher education. And I have discovered in 20 years, I started when I was five, by the way. <laughs> I discovered in 20 years there is no such thing. There is lying. Um, so I also want to thank Roseanne Santos Elliot for this opportunity to share some of my research. I will be defending this semester, but I was really excited to share some of just the highlights of, of the study that I've, I've done. Um, so Latinas in higher ed, woo -woo, very excited. Um, I want to thank NYU for letting us use this space, and Dr. Ye Yeti Marquez and Dr. Delmi Landoff. Yeti, I just got to meet in the last year. And Delmi has been in this long haul with me for quite a while. Right, Delmi? Is she in the room? Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I just followed her. I took one position right after her at Columbia Teachers College, so that was kind of fun. I also want to thank the amazing 26 Latinas who were part of my study. My IRB proposal said I'm going to interview 20, but people kept contacting me, and I couldn't stop. And there's a, there's a type A, a little bit of a type A that said, hmm, I'm already naming everybody alphabetically, and there are 26 letters. <laughs> I got to 25 and I said, okay, uh, I need a 26. <laughs> so I got to Z. I got to Z. So I was very excited. I want to thank my family right over here. I think this has a little, uh, oh, oh, in the middle. Oh, the perfect. middle button is the uh, Okay, all the way to the right. That is my family. I wouldn't be able to do anything that, I, that I've done if it wasn't for my life partner, Antonio, and my two beautiful children, Mariana and Joaquin. Um, I also want to thank my Grupo Cinco. We, in the summer, part of the Latino doctoral, complete, Latina completing doctor degree group in Facebook that now has a thousand members. We're almost approaching 1,100. I started two, a year and a half ago and said, you know, if a few of us, 25 of us, 20, could get together in this group and kind of share, commiserate, have a private space, that'd be awesome. A thousand people, and it is running itself. How many of you are in that group right now? And you see the activity. So, I barely have to even like anything anymore in it. So, I, I think it's really amazing. It's really cool. And it, from that, last summer, we formed a writing group. Um, and it's been so wonderful and, and just supportive. Some of you might know some of those folks. Um, Dr. Young, Young Kim, who took me on, I was at Seton Hall 20 years ago. Someone was just telling me that they had the same mentor that I had, who was my first professor, in 1994 when I started my master's there. And it's been, it's been a rough road trying to figure this out. Trying to, I stopped out for a while. I said, forget it. I quit, finished the coursework, did the comps, did everything, and said, I'm not going to do this. And something inspired me a couple of years ago, Dr. Angelica Perez. Is anyone part of her group? She was just like, do the topic you want to do. And this is my third dissertation, by the way. I can send you the other two. You can have them. <laughs> but I had topics that I could care less about. And she said, what are you passionate about? I said, I'm passionate about Latina administrators. She goes, write about that. That's what's going to motivate you. And Dr. Kim took me on and said, yep, I agree with you that that's a good topic. All the other faculty in that program had said, eh, I don't know. Do people really care about this topic? So that's important. Um, and I want to thank Costa University for letting me be here during my work day. <laughs> I'm getting paid to be right here. <laughs> but I do want to share with you one video that I am proud of because if you had asked me four years ago, five years ago, would I ever do Taekwondo? <laughs> I'd be like, Shh, are you kidding? And I used to take my kids and um, one day, 50 pounds ago, the Taekwondo instructor, Master Lee, came up to me and said, you know, you're going to die. You're not going to be here for your kids if you keep letting yourself go like you are. Because he saw me after I had my son and he said, um, yeah, you really need to watch yourself. If you lose 20 pounds, I will let you come to class. I'll even give you a discount. And I was like, discount? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not about that. <laughs> you know us, we like sales. So <laughs> I lost those 20 pounds, and I did go to class, and this was when I was doing my red belt test. So hope it works. Yeah! This was after two hours of physical training, push-ups, running, Two hours, this is what he does for a test. Yeah. And it isn't until the very end you get this treat yeah, <laughs> to break this board. <laughs> and these are, I was doing the back spinning hook kick. Um, so now I'm red belt, third stripe, but I had a knee injury last March. If you read my blog, you'll see that I was just like, oh, but guess what? 
Those four weeks that I was laid up, not able to move, not able to do anything, that's what I was doing. 26 interviews. <laughs> to really talk about some of these issues that, that I found in my study. Um, so I'll give you some literature highlights. I have a lot of slides on literature. I'll go through them quickly, don't worry. Uh, I won't do that by PowerPoint. But I left them in just because if you see a name or a research, I have all these in PDF, I'm happy to share anything that you see on the screen, any topic that, that piques your interest. Um, then I have some highlights from my top five findings. I actually have 20 something findings, but if anyone has ever done a qualitative research, you can't have 20 findings. Right, Yeti? Right, tell me? So I gotta narrow down. But at least I got the top five. Then we're gonna do some round table discussion. So we're good? So, quick little bit about me. Um, something important to know is that house in the middle, I'm really proud of that picture because that's the house my mother grew up in. My mother had really high aspirations for me and my sisters. She didn't know where we were gonna go, what we were gonna do. She didn't need to know. And that's gonna come up later. That's an important point not knowing what the next step is. She moved here from Dominican Republic. I swear I was born. I was barely one. I used to say, I came here when I was one. I'm like, where am I going when I'm one? I was brought here when I was one, to the Bronx. And I was right here from DR. But when I go back, I am so grateful for what I have because I know what could have been. I love this picture of my family because it was the seven of us, but my, one of my brothers is missing, but um, you know, we really support each other. My mother got to second grade. My dad, I don't think, went to school, but knew how to write, read, would read newspapers. And somehow my mother always knew education was going to get us to the next step, whatever it was. It didn't matter what it was. She just knew it. We all got our bachelor's degree. She was like, oh, good. She dragged my brother through. <laughs> he got his associates, and he's a computer engineer now. So trust me, that he makes more than all of us. <laughs> and all of us have master's degrees. And my mother used to say, oh, What's that? I would explain to her all along the way what a bachelor's degree, what, what high school was, what a bachelor's degree was, what a master's degree was. So she would meet our friends and she would say, Ella tiene un master. Ella no tiene un master. Why doesn't she have a master's? Is she lazy? <laughs> Check her out. So that's the little symbol for, and then this, this is the little symbol about the Latinas completing doctorate degrees that I already spoke about. I just needed, it was a selfish effort first because I just needed the support, I needed a network. And I tried joining other groups, like women's groups. I tried joining a black PhD group. And I tried joining others. It just wasn't the same. And some of the infighting that would happen. Has anyone joined a Facebook group and you have to just take yourself out? Because some of the shenanigans that go on, you're like, no. That's that what happens in, in our group. So these were my research questions. And I'll just do highlights. First, I was looking at institutional experiences, just generally speaking. I was looking at racial identity. Race is a very touchy subject in Latino communities. Nationalities and ethnicities, that was something else that I wanted to look at. And I wanted to look at gender. And how those three things combined have shaped our experiences, but not just the experiences we're having in higher education, but what career aspirations we have or don't have. I think that's another point. So again, these are the many, many slides that I'll just go through really quickly. But I found in the literature that there's a lack of executive leadership in academia. And that came through in my study when people kept saying, I don't know any senior student affairs officers that are Latinas. I've never met a Latina dean. I've never met a Latina president. They're out there. They exist. Unfortunately, we're just not seeing them in maybe the spaces that we're navigating, in the schools that we're, we're at. We have ne negative work experiences due to microaggressions, due to stereotypes, discrimination, whatever's in the media sometimes for people if they've never experienced being with Latinos, they just assume that we're all the same. And they just assume that every culture is like the next. Even my boss brought me a pozole. Does anyone know what a pozole is? Yes. OK, I didn't. Because <laughs> I'm Dominican. And Dominicans don't make pozole. No, we don't. But he's from New Mexico and grew up with Chicanos. 
who make pozole, and he brought it to me, and it was hot. It was really spicy. And I was like, oh, this is spicy. He goes, you're telling a gringo that, you're, that this is spicy? I'm like, but we do different kind of spice. So even in introducing him to the idea that we eat different things and that Caribbean Latinos are a little bit different than Mexican or Chicanos was really interesting. And then that unique bicultural identity, that we're trying to straddle many different worlds, different things, different expectations, whether they're our own expectations or other people of us, our own families, are always asking us questions. So what do you do? What do you do all day? How many of you have, tri have tried to explain your job to your family? <laughs> and you're still in school? No terminate todavía. Get tanto, Aina. So, a little bit about the purpose. I wanted to make sure that there's more information out there about us. I wanted to make sure that we highlight that there are a whole bunch of amazing ones of us who are out there doing the best we can, like everybody else. But somehow, there are some barriers that are a little bit unique for us. And I wanted to make sure I present a group of women that's, that is the pipeline to the presidency. Not that all of us need to be, but I want us to feel like we can if we want to. And that takes a lot of even our own, um, getting our, out of our own way. So this is one for Birbaum and Umbach. This was a quote that really spoke to me, because even they are realizing, two white men are saying, Hmm, connected with these issues of people, why people of color are not moving up is that they are experiencing discrimination, past and present, I'm thinking future, because we're not done yet, covert and overt, recognized or ignored, which may have influenced individual aspirations. That was the one word I was like, they're not just talking about our everyday experiences, they're talking about what are we doing next? What do we think we need to be doing? So that was really important that we do not fully understand. So now I hope that my study can highlight some of this. I, for those of you who are geeky in the room and like theoretical frameworks, which I don't like, but I had to pick something. Um, so I put together critical race theory, Latino critical race theory, and critical race feminism to put together my own way framework to look at the three identities of um, race, ethnicity, and gender. So something in the literature review about student affairs is that the experience is different for administrators of color. Shocking. <laughs> Anybody surprised? No. Um, that women, Hispanic women, are significantly less satisfied with their jobs. And a lot of it has to do with being asked to be in, on committees and do things that are just more diversity related and doesn't put them in positions of power to be able to do the next step, like supervising people. That women are bottlenecked in mid-level and bottlenecked in positions, again, that are ethnic related and don't have the respect that many institutions that I think it should have. Doing ethnic related work is hard. My previous position at Fordham was assistant dean for multicultural affairs. I have an easier time now as a dean. I'm not saying easy, easy. I'm just saying that there are some things that I struggled with trying to bring forward the idea of diversity. There's nothing like explaining to people that something's important when they don't even know what it is. You don't know what you don't know, right? So trying to do that in a, at a predominantly white institution is really tough. Anybody doing that now? Or trying to? All right. So the pathway to SAO, SSAO, I actually have a chart, if anyone's interested, that's really interesting, that shows what the usual path to the senior student affairs officer um, positions are, and diversity work is not that. So I remember putting on Facebook, I think I defied gravity. When I got the call from my boss, Houston, offering me the job, I'm like, oh, you're not telling me that I'm, I was really nice and everyone liked me, but I'm sorry we picked somebody else? <laughs> That's amazing, because I thought to myself, I had already seen the statistics, and I didn't think I was going to get that position. Some things about, so I looked at Latinas in different realms, Latinas as students, Latinas as faculty, and then Latinas as administrators, and how we experience things. And at all those different levels, they're not that different. They're all about the bicultural identities, the confidence that we come in with, but then other people start telling us things. We get really confident about our work, we feel really smart, we're a math major, we're this, we're that, we're biology, and people go, well, you sure you want to be a doctor? Because you know, you're going to want to have kids, right? And being a doctor is hard. And you're going to be really busy. Has anyone ever had conversations like this? Or heard about conversations like this? So this is what's happening to our undergraduate students, and even graduate students. Gender roles. 
especially in families. One of my participations, but um, it's not in my, in my findings that I'm sharing here, but one of my participants said, I'm Puerto Rican, my husband's Puerto Rican, I work full time, but we still, as, as modern as I am, I still go home and I still have the regular gender roles. I'm the primary caregiver of my children. I'm the one that has to work out the deal with trying to get them out of school and figure out the after school. And I still do the dishes, I still have to cook. And even while we're talking, at the end she goes, I gotta reevaluate my life here. <laughs> I'm glad I can help you um, think about that, but I feel bad that, you know, that's the reality for, for a lot of us. As faculty, this was probably one of the most striking, but this is where the research sits most robust. How students treat us, how I've heard over and over from, you know, it's in the research, but I've heard it myself from faculty who are standing in front of the room and a student walks up and says, um, can you tell me when the professor is going to get here? Has anyone ever experienced that? Being in a space where you're the one in charge and they're looking for the person in charge because they think you don't look like that? That's one of the things, just disrespectful students or condescending colleagues or colleagues that don't value the research that you're doing because their research is so much more important and more relevant. Medieval classics is so much more relevant. <laughs> I'm not, medieval classics is good, if anybody here is classics. But there definitely is a value with some of the colleagues in faculty life about what's good research and what's important research. Okay, as administrators, nothing I haven't said already. Bottlenecked in mid-level, boxed into ethnic roles, and that word came up out of 26 people. 20 said the word, I feel boxed in. I feel stuck, or I feel like people are pigeonholing me. That same kind of language. Stereotypes and gender discrimination. Lack of mentorship from other Latinas. And we'll go through this later about mentorship. That's one of the findings. But the, the positive thing, I found all negative, right? The allure of student affairs is that we, as undergraduate, felt so supported that we wanted to stay in and do the same thing for others. That's part of our nature, to help others and be of service. That we found opportunities, people tapped us, people looked and saw some potential in us, and we rose to the challenge, and student affairs feels natural for us. Many people in the study said, I fell into it. I didn't know it existed, but someone said, you know what, this would be really great for you to do, and it just feels good to go to work.